through the protective doors, down a corridor and onto a unit that few will even know exists. The ward is uh, almost full. We've got 18 beds, as I said, and we've got at the moment 17 patients. All of them are on ECMO at the moment. This is the Royal Brompton Hospital's ECMO Centre in London. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Patients kept alive by a small machine that pumps blood outside the body and allows the lungs to rest. There are six of these centres in the UK. All have been striving to keep some of the very sickest COVID-19 patients alive after ventilators have failed. It's no wonder they're sometimes called the Hail Mary wards. Dr. Stefan Lodeau is in charge here. We're caring for the sickest patient probably in the country. Uh, and as you can see, they're all very young. So, uh, and the, the staff caring for them, of course, is caring with lo lots of compassion. And of course, if they're here with us, it means that they already have some time in another intensive care and failed other conventional therapy. <laughs> We're interrupted by the cardiac arrest alarm going off in a side bay. Staff who we hadn't even seen before suddenly appear. Everyone now well versed in an emergency. This is a team that hasn't always worked together before now, yet it seemed seamless. Channel 4 News was given exclusive access to this unit, not least because these staff want the public to know that this pandemic is still here. Garden centres may be opening, but people are still dying. Many hospitals now have got more intensive care capacity, but in reality they are still sick, very sick patients, very young patients with no comorbidity that are still needing a very high support of care. So you wonder how it will look like in the next few weeks when the lockdown is released. Because but that's you must worry that, that suddenly you'll have another surge. Exactly. So we didn't release. We're still at uh, the highest alert. After the alarm, our hearts are racing. But for Joe Tillman, the critical care matron, this is all part of caring for such sick patients. So what, what happened? Um, so the, the nursing team were providing personal care and they were turning the patient and his heart rate became very low. So they pulled the emergency bell to obtain help. Um, by the time the team were he here, the patient had started to resolve and his heart rate had gone back to normal. The patients are transferred here from hospitals across the southwest of England and they are chosen to go on ECMO because there is that hope. Usually they have no underlying health conditions and were reasonably fit. The machine essentially keeps the patient alive and uh, actually work when uh, the lungs of the patient are failing. So you can see some uh, blood which is very dark going to the, from the patient to the machine. Going through the machine, the blood is oxygenated, the carbon dioxide is uh, cleared and the red blood, which is oxygenated, is going back to the patient. That's, you can see the you can see difference the very, very clearly. Big difference. Yeah, clearly. So we keep the patient alive and it's not a treatment, it's a life support and it buys some time for the lungs to get better. You know, nothing does prepare you for coming onto a unit like this, but one thing that stands out is just how young many of these patients are. And also, the fact is, they are so unutterably sick. And for many, this is, we've been told, their last option. The patients are mainly in their 30s and 40s and are mostly black, Asian and minority ethnic. When you're, when you're nursing this patient, did, what are you thinking about her? She, she has to pull through, I want her to pull through. Because we, we've seen horrible stories and everything on the media and families losing their loved ones and um, also the family is not able to come in to hold their hand. Instead, there is the family liaison service acting as a bridge between the patients and the families. They call them every single day, even if there is no real change to report. Well, the first time I did it, I didn't cope so well because it was really hard. Um, I phoned eight people's family and I put the phone down eight times and six of those times I put my head back and I just started crying because it was really difficult. Um, because you can just imagine how it would be if it was you. I think it's incredibly brave what they're doing. 
not being able to see their families. I think the want to be next to your loved one when they're this critically ill must just be a thing that they're constantly fighting. And every time you speak to them, even though it's sad, even though it can be difficult, you just, you've, it, it just feels like you're doing good. It feels like you're doing something good. We still hope because being positive people. And for two weeks, Margaret Lucas held on to the support that came from those calls as her husband Damien lay fighting for his life. You know, nothing was too much for them. So it, they always just showed a sense that they would go beyond. And they did, you know, some of the things we pushed, I pushed the boundaries a bit and I said, look, can I sing to my husband down the air? I know he might not be able to hear me. And, you know, and they honoured that. And, you know, from that, you know, they would put the phone by his ear and then I would sing into his ear. You know, just, you know, we know how powerful music can be. So that's where we went. <laughs> The South of the Royal Brompton, I, I wish I could, I knew who they were, firstly, um, because obviously, uh, you know, I have no recollection of who they are, but certainly um, the fact that they saved my life uh, and brought me back to my family, uh, I, I, you know, there's not an amount of words to actually say to that. It's, you know, thankful and grateful for their care uh, and for what they did. Back at the Royal Brompton, and as we were about to finish filming, suddenly a call came through. Another desperately ill COVID patient needing to be transferred from a hospital just north of London. So they can't be ventilated. They're not successfully ventilated, so we're going to put them on ECMO and bring them back here. It's too early in this pandemic to know the overall survival rate for ECMO. Some reports have put it as high as 68%, but they're not committing themselves here at the Royal Brompton. Yet it is clear it has been needed. When ventilation fails a patient, there is nothing else. The cameraman in that report, Stephen Hurd. Our health and social care editor, Victoria MacDonald, is in the newsroom for us now. Victoria. John, at the beginning of this pandemic, there were concerns, of course, about not enough ventilators, and there were also concerns about not enough ECMO machines, and they were increased in numbers. But the very sad fact is that few patients actually benefit from going on these machines. And I really must pay tribute to the staff at the Royal Brompton, who were just amazing, so compassionate and calm. There has been a change announced to the symptoms list today. Tell us about that. Yes, for a long time there have been reports that, uh, um, that a loss of sense of smell and sometimes with that taste um, ha has, is one of the symptoms of COVID-19. And I know from my own family, my nephew, who reported it five days after his first symptom, now officially the government has accepted that this should be another symptom. So high fever contin or continuous cough or loss of smell. And if you have any or all of those symptoms, then you should report them and you should self-isolate. Now, there have been some reports that as many as 59% of people with COVID-19 have lost their sense of smell. The government doesn't quite accept that, but they think that they will pick up an extra 2 or 3% of people uh, just by adding this new uh, symptom.